Amjad Massad at Replit, uh, Clem DeLong at Hugging Face. Thank you so much for coming on stage. We, we promised a spicy panel for the last one, right, you guys? Uh, yes. Um, thanks so much for sticking out. We'll have happy hour after this. What, I mean, I feel like OpenAI like, has loomed so large. And like, in particular, you know, you're competing pretty directly, you know, Replit helping coders, competing directly with like GitHub Copilot and the sort of Microsoft, I don't know, powerhouse with OpenAI. Like, how do you, how do you grapple with their sort of dominance in this space as a company? Yeah, I mean, initially we started building on GPT-3, like in like, we started building on GPT-2 actually in 2019. Um, and in GPT-3, like early 2020, and like we were ready to go, but they weren't letting people like release applications. I don't know if you remember, but you had to go through this uh, ethics board uh, before you launch an open AI application at the early days. Um, and, and, and so we're sort of, sort of like held back by some capabilities problems, by some of the economics, by some of the um, processes. At the same time, Microsoft was building Copilot. And so, you know, we were building, we had the ideas, we had the platform, we had everything. And it just became exceedingly clear to us, for us to actually compete, we can't build on OpenAI. So we started training our own models. We're a very small company, especially at the time, but we decided to kind of want to do that. Uh, you know, fork GPT-2, try to fine tune that. Uh, eventually, like, things kind of happened where Salesforce released this, like, code generation model. Why did Salesforce? you know, train a code generation model, who knows? But turns out it's actually like pretty good. And so we did um, extra work on it, it was really slow. We improved its speed like two or three orders of magnitude. Uh, we hosted it and then we built the front end around it and everything. Uh, and we started fine tuning it based on our data and we put it out to market and we got a product out. But had we known that, you know, it was gonna be hard to build an open AI because of the relationship with Microsoft, we would have done that earlier. Like you feel like they unfairly blocked you? No, I don't feel like we unfairly blocked me. I feel like their deal with Microsoft just gives Microsoft an advantage. And, and like, if you want to compete with Microsoft, you can't use OpenAI. And we'll, we'll come back to Google soon. But I, I want to let you get on here. I mean, what is your view on the state of like open source? I mean, we had, you know, a mod at stability on earlier. What, like, how strong as like sort of a a system of options is open source today. Do you think we will see an open source version of ChatGPT4 soon or GPT4 soon? Yeah, I mean, to your first question, I think the domination of OpenAI is, is really overblown, especially here in San, in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley. I was looking at it uh, yesterday since the release of ChatGPT, right, which is supposed to be this one model to do everything. Uh, we've seen on Hugging Face the release of over 100,000 models, right? So companies are not training models just, just for fun, right? Like they're training models because actually it improves their performance as Amjad described. Even if there's one model from OpenAI right now that is like making the rounds and that everyone is talking about, ultimately what we're seeing is that for most companies, most use cases, when you want something that is fast, cheap, and works for your use case, actually company build their own models. So small models can be fast, models. cheap, but can a small model be better than GPT-4 in a use case? In most use cases, yes. Um, not so much today on very general use cases, but in my opinion, that's fine, because for example, if you want to do a customer support bot, bot you don't really care about it telling you about the meaning of life or the weather in San Francisco, right? You want it to be really good at your specialized, customized use case. Um, so there's all this hype around kind of like big generalist models, which is interesting. It's good, it's powerful. It makes sense for use case like Bing, for example, because they want to answer all the questions in the world. But the truth of, the, of it is that for most companies when they have a specialized uh, use case, it makes more sense for actually for them to build their own models, train their own models. So in my opinion, in a few years, we'll just have uh, a world where every single company is going to have their own GPT-4 or their own chat GPT. 
Uh, and that's what's going to allow them to build differentiation, to customize, to align these models with their own company values, right, and not rely right. on the open AI's values. In my opinion, that's a better world, too. OK, so you partnered with Google. Ben Thompson wrote in Stratechery that Google you know, should have acquired you, and that in some ways not acquiring you was a strategic error. Did Google try to buy Replit? I, I can't comment on that, but we've been saying um, no. We've been saying no to acquisitions for a long time. I mean, we famously said no to a billion dollar acquisition, like when we were like six people. Yeah, so, so is there a bigger number that's... Uh... <laughs> I don't know, I mean, uh, do you have an offer? <laughs> we'll take a look. But uh, no, seriously, like I think I think the the potential for Replit is is really huge, um, and um, and we're just getting started. We're just like warming up, and it just doesn't feel like it's the right time to do that. I mean, the partnership with Google will give us huge acceleration, and it's like a very very much win 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 partnership, um, and so that's exciting, and we'll see what will that bring us. I mean, both of you are companies where I think people are really cheering for you, excited about the companies, and then they say to me, but like, well, ask them about the business model a little bit. Like, can, can you talk about like the hugging face business model and like, how are you guys gonna make a lot of money? Uh, that's still an open question, <laughs> uh, but uh, we're starting to show that we can, we can do it. Uh, and the way we do it is very uh, uh, typical, I would say, of platforms with uh, the high level of freemium model. Right? We have uh, 15,000 companies using us today, uh, and the percentage of them are paying us. So we have 3,000 customers today, and they're paying us for premium enterprise features, right? so kind of like user management, for example, uh, or they're paying us for compute. They want to run Hugging Face uh, on faster GPUs, faster, faster hardware. Like um, you strike a deal with someone who provides the compute and then your server reseller, or what's your relationship there? Yes, we uh, provide compute associated with the usage of the platform. Um, so the overall model is, uh, and, and I imagine it's gonna be a bit similar for, for Replit, uh, very similar to what a GitHub does. Um, GitHub has just crossed a billion dollar in revenue, right? So they're proving that this, this model works. And I bet most of it is compute, most of it is actions. Yes, yes. That's a bet. Yes. All right, you can, wh wh where, are, where is Replit in the monetization? Or, uh, yeah, go ahead. yeah, we just uh, released our pro plan, which is like $20 a month, which is exploding now. Um, there's like a lot of latent demand, um, kind of switching from user growth and adoption to monetization. Uh, turns out, wow, it's like, there's, <laughs> it's like a lot easier than we thought. And it's cool that this climate kind of allows that, where, you know, it's like grow, 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 you know, be everywhere. So like, oh, maybe you should like figure out the unit economics and the business model. We actually like that now that we're figuring that part out and we're making a ton of progress on that. And so uh, right now it's like more, you know, prosumer, individual developers and uh, startups. A lot of YC startups are launching on Replit right now. Just yesterday there was a company called... Uh, that means uh, like they do all the coding in yeah. Replit. Okay. Yeah, they do all the coding in Replit and... A lot of them do like go to market on Replit. So Vocode, for example, yesterday is this you know conversational programming uh, framework. Uh, they did their main launch on Replit. Another company called Leap AI did uh, their main launch on Replit as well. And so the cool thing is that you can find your initial customer set in the same way that Hacker News used to be. That I think Replit is increasingly uh, taking that place. Um, and it, I think there's like like Hugging Face. There's tremendous opportunities. For, for monetization. It, it, at the limit, we're probably a cloud company. Um, like I think selling compute and selling cloud services uh, is very attractive. And it also scales very well. Like you know, consumption-based pricing is, is really attractive. What, uh, I mean, what are the coolest projects on Hugging Face right now? Or you just, you're, you're very in touch with like, the, the cutting edge of AI. Like what, uh, what should be we, people be watching there that you think really is sort of like the next thing? And what are you watching that's hosted on Hugging Face that you think is worth paying attention to? Everything but text, <laughs> right? Like uh, everyone is kind of like with the open AI focus, like looking, looking at text. Uh, but actually, it's a very small subset of AI in general. 
um, and looking at what's everything, everything that is not text gives kind of like a clearer picture of what is AI today. Uh, so for example, I'm really excited this week about text to video. Um, if you remember for text to image, there was a, the first viral model was uh, called Dali Mini. Um, we at the Dali Mini time uh, for, for text to video, where you're starting to be able to generate video that kind of look bad. Right, that look, it looks look, amazing. I love the, <laughs> the Will Smith eating spaghetti video. Yes. Did you see that? No. no. If yes. you haven't seen that, look it yes. up. You're yes. going to stare at it for an hour and laugh. Yes. yes. It's scary. It's disturbing. But uh, somebody just typed in text and this video was created. Exactly. It creates kind of And like this is open source? Or open source uh, on Hugging Face, luckily. Um, and uh, and the, the, the thing is, what's going to be interesting is that these first models are. Uh, kind of like outputting very weird, very um, uncanny videos, but it's going to attract a lot of attention and really, really fast it's going to get better and we're going to get in a few months to the same level of quality that we're getting right now on, on text. So in a few months? Exciting. Yes, yes, in a few months. Anything that excites you in particular? Or? Uh, about like, just like the development of AI or like, thing, like projects that people are working on. Oh, um... Well, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there's like a, I, I think Nat Friedman put it uh, as capability overhang. Like, I, I think the capabilities of the models on the platform not right now are actually exceeded uh, the product deployment. So I think there's like, uh, there's a lot more product to build than the, yeah, you know, uh, uh, until we catch up to the capabilities, right? So. Um, you know, on the on the sort of code generation side or co coding side, um, like we think that uh, as as much as Copilot is like amazing, we think it's like fairly primitive. Uh, you know, considering what we can build, like uh, you know, with the the way Copilot works is that you add it as an extension to your editor, and it's sort of sitting there trying to predict your keystrokes. Right? It's basically a glorified sort of typing um, uh, aid. Whereas what we're trying to do with Ghostwriter, Replit's kind of uh, Replit's coding assistant, is like an actual agent that's sitting on your computer and reading your files, trying to make suggestions to your code, uh, trying to learn from how you program in order to like automate things for you before you even say them. How far away is Replit being a coder itself, right? I mean, there's always this fear of like, the platform competing with the people who use the platform. But it feels like, OK, if I can be a great assistant to coders, someday you'll, your company will be a great coder. Or how do you think about just, yeah, sort of AI coding on its own, not as an assistant, but as an actual coder? Yeah, so I, I think that will happen. Um, but you know, uh, th that question is really a question about the future work generally. And I think what happens is, a lot of the uh, repeated stuff that we know how to do, we just train people how to do it, and people generally do it without applying a lot of creativity, that stuff gets automated, right? Because it's easy to automate. We have a lot of data, uh, we have a lot of knowledge on how to do it. You don't have to write the like, you know, uh, 300 trillionth left pad function, right? Like everyone le writes left pad functions. And, um, and so this stuff will get automated but what that means is that humans can go do more creative, more advanced things. And I think that's good thing about technology is that we automate the things that are automatable so that we can go on to creative things. I don't think we're at a point, and by the way, all the hype and all the excitement about GPT-4 and all of that, and we're ex really excited about it. We're big beneficiaries of, of this whole thing of people, you know, go generate code GPT-4, put it in Replit and run it. The reality is it's still not very good at completely novel code. Like if you're writing essentially like super novel uh, functionality, it's like not as good at it uh, as much as things that it's seen in its uh, training sets. So I think we're very far uh, from the point where you have a completely autonomous programmer. I think it's probably coming in the next couple of years where it will feel like you're coding with an assistant but it's, it's a far cry from like automating all programming jobs. Is Hugging Face available in China? Or what's sort of the 
breadth of open source and like how much do you think these open source AI projects are gonna continue to be available all over the world? So personally, I think the main risk for AI today is concentration of power. Um, these technologies are powerful and what we need for them to be sustainably uh, deployed in our society is for more, more people to understand how they work, understand what they've been trained on, um, and understand how to limit and mitigate them. So it's really been our mission to bring more transparency to the AI world. Uh, because otherwise you end up with a world where uh, these technologies are built behind closed doors uh, and it creates these kind of like narratives completely disconnected to the reality. You know, like what Amjad was describing is that they're kind of like glorified autocomplete and at the same time in the public sphere you see letters with people describing it as Robocop of these things kind of like that is going to take over and destroy the world. And in my opinion, it's um, created partly because there's a lack of transparency and education about how these technologies are built and how they work. By the way, the, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the safety concerns uh, come from hype and um, these things, you know, a lot of these big companies are beneficiaries of hype. So they are, in, in a sense, beneficiaries of the anxiety, right? So, for example, Microsoft Research uh, got an early version of GP, GPT-4, naturally, and they wrote a paper uh, calling it uh, First Contact with Artificial General Intelligence. And, and then they commented that out, they left it in the latex, and then they change its sparks of uh, AGI, right? So they're using science and archive and research, and they put out a preprint, as a marketing uh, opportunity. But it, as a way, they're marketing the system as artificial general intelligence, and then they're feeding all the fears of the people that have been talking about the problems of AGI, and then it's creating a very toxic environment where for them it's marketing, but for a lot of people it's life or death. Right. Yeah, and I want to pull on that thread, but sorry, I just, but China, is it available in China? Yes, it's yes. available in China. And you're saying yes. it should be, was really it your answer, be. because yes. you want people to understand it. Yes. I mean, and okay, thank you. And then in terms of this problem of like, yeah, people are hyping, AGI is like possible, but then at the same time, you were sort of saying, we haven't even fully seized all the benefits of the technology we have. So it, it feels like it does sort of swing back and forth from the same people where it can feel like, oh my God, like this thing, there's power we haven't even gotten out of it yet that we, we don't understand, but then at the same time, you don't want to overhype it. I don't, it's just hard for people to totally understand, yeah, what, what, what's next or sort of how much more powerful it can get. Yeah, but, but I think um, sort of like the companies calling it AGI is misguided and like there's a definition of AGI and, and perhaps dishonest. Uh, and, you know, the people have been writing about AGI for, you know, 70 years now, right? And so to call GPT-4 AGI is a huge stretch. I, I don't think even OpenAI wouldn't call it that, but Microsoft did, right? And, um, and then you have people who've been worrying about AGI, like Nick Bostrom, Elias Jodzkowski, and the Max Segmark that wrote the letter. Um, and basically you're telling them everything that you worried about we just built. Right, and then of course they're gonna freak out. Right, what, it's sort of changing, changing, oh, did you wanna say something? Yeah. Yes, I think the main challenge is that this future forward-looking, um, futuristic, sci-fi driven narratives, they blind us from the priorities which are mitigating the challenges of today. So for example, at Hugging Face, something that we work really heavily on is to uh, mitigate some of the biases in these models, right? If you give to um, stable diffusion uh, a prompt uh, to create an image for a CEO, for example, it, it's going to create um, a man's face, 
right? Uh, and not really give you any, any woman faces. Yeah. Um, and by kind of like picturing this uh, Robocop thing, we focus the public narrative on something that hasn't happened, that might never happen, and we don't focus on the real challenges of today, like biases, like misinformation, like lack of transparency and control of power. So that's, in my opinion, why, why it's dangerous. Yeah, what do, you, what do you do about that? I mean, that's a great point. Well, you know, like, you, you, you pull down something that doesn't account for bias the way you want, you give feedback to the creators, or what's the actual like, protocol for, for getting people to, to consider the bias? There are a bunch of different measures. Uh, we actually released three weeks ago a bias detector for uh, image de generation models uh, by a team member called, called Sasha in the Hugging Face team, uh, which allows you to try to detect the biases of these models. And it's really useful for uh, people who are underrepresented, uh, for them to realize what kind of biases are there. Um, and then we uh, advocate for publicity of that from the model builders so that the companies that are going to integrate these systems into their products can take that into account. So for example, if you take a resume classification model, right, uh, to classify if a, a resume is good or not or a candidate is good or not, if you see that it's biased in terms of like gender distribution, then you know that you're gonna not put that as the main filter and that you'll need human in the loop to make sure that it's not biased against, against women. Um, so this is called uh, model cards uh, and data set cards. We have over 100,000 of them on the Hugging Face Hub. It's pioneered by someone called Dr. Margaret Mitchell, who was the co-founder and co-lead of the AI ethics team at Google before, who's now at Hugging Face. Um, so that the builders actually take that into account when they build their products with this technology. I mean, you both have expressed concern about you know, the centralization of power within AI. Is the answer only everybody else needs to get really good at it? Or like, is there anything to be done about, yeah, I mean, are you advocates of like legislation? I don't know, are you starting to talk to members of Congress or it's just everybody needs to outcompete them? I, I actually worry about that. So I worry about regulatory capture. You see a lot of the big players are already um, going around and-, and Please regulate us in a way Please that might help us. them. Yeah. In the history of, of regulatory capture, it shows that you know, that's what you do, that's the rational thing to do when, you're, when you get big is to you, know, you pull out the ladder, right? So I worry about that more than anything else. Uh, and I think the, again, this codependence, this hype slash fear is playing into the hands of those who want to create regulatory capture, right? So you create more anxiety, and therefore pe people ask for regulation, and you're like the hero, oh yeah, let me, here's, we already wrote the regulation, you know, which basically says no other startup could, could, could compete. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think open source is like a great way of, of doing that, and I think, like, you know, to Clem's point, uh, open source is actually like a great way to also um, stress test these systems and also create uh, systems that protect us from the negative harms. So, like, there's a lot of systems right now built around stable diffusion to detect stable diffusion images, to kind of d do reverse stable uh, diffusion, show what, what the sources are, and credit the artist. There's a tremendous amount of innovation in open source around safety and security and all of that. Do you, do you agree with that view that regulation would basically help Microsoft and the incumbents and therefore against it, or do you have a point of view there? It's a complicated question. I think we're in a fast evolving field uh, that needs some regulation. Um, and I think for me the most important thing for uh, good regulation is that the regulators can understand mm -hmm. the systems, um, which sounds challenging today, uh, again, uh, because it feels of like the they barely understand Facebook. The idea that they're going to understand, uh, yeah, ChatGPT or whatever. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's different uh, between kind of like the previous generation of tech and the new generation of AI, in my opinion, because um, in traditional software, uh, because it's rule-based, 
you can kind of like test a product and understand how it works. For AI systems, the creators you can don't even test know. It. You can test it for a day, for a week, for a month. It doesn't lead you to really understand it if you don't have access to the data set, if you don't see what it's been trained on, how it's been trained on. So in my opinion, for the AI era, we really need to advocate and push for more transparency because that's how we're going to... Into what people are training on. Yes. Okay, what I'm, I'm going to open up to a question. Um, are, what's your partnership with Amazon? Or how, how serious is your relationship with Amazon? Pretty serious. We've been working with them for, uh, for three years. Uh, we are a platform, so we are also working with all the cloud providers. Um, but uh, we've had a very fruitful collaboration in kind of like making it easier for companies to use open source plus AWS to build AI systems internally. Questions, questions, great, yeah. Hello, um, I feel like there's this tension between, you know, we want the open AI and the big companies to be more transparent, but then we also are concerned about proliferation and bad actors being great, let me take that model and go do something evil with it. And you know, the people like the good guys are like, we need more transparency, but we need more responsibility. And I, I just haven't really seen how you reconcile, like just open everything up, but also, you know, gatekeep access so that bad actors don't run away with these things. Yeah, there's a very good paper from uh, someone called Irene Soleiman, who was actually at OpenAI before and who's at Tugging Face right now, on the different risks and challenges of different release strategies. Um, it poses different, different challenges, right? When you keep it closed source, behind closed door, you create concentration of, of power. Uh, you make it more difficult for civil society, underrepresented populations to participate, for regulators to actually uh, regulate. When you make it more open and more transparent, you are more inclusive. Um, you, in some, some way, reduce the risk because you create power and counter powers at the same time. Uh, so even if an actor, which is by definition much smaller, than the actors who control it right now, right? Because right now it's the biggest players, right, that are controlling, the biggest companies, uh, the biggest uh, governments and, and countries. So actually the risk of having smaller players misuse it is counterbalanced by the fact that you can create the, the counter power to actually uh, mitigate these, these risks. I know it's not always straightforward, but if you look at kind of like the long-term safety of the development of a technology, uh, more openness and more transparency is actually uh, much more sustainable in the long run and creating much less risks than uh, keeping this power in the hands of the very few number of big companies. Great. Hi there. I just have a question for Amjad, actually. Replit has emerged as this like huge AI power player. So kudos to you, building your own models, Ghostwriter. Um, it seems quite different from the initial focus of Replit as really an educational tool, and specifically a tool for people learning how to code. It seems like the initial audience was beginner developers, and now it's actually very advanced, sophisticated developers who want to pull in the latest AI. And so I'm just curious how you feel about that and like what is Replit? Is it an ed tech company, an AI company? Um, what was the plan and kind of like what happened there? Yeah, our plan from the start is to build an end-to-end -end platform uh, for software development. Like our sort of North Star since day zero was idea to product. So like how do you have an idea in your head and how do you like put out a product out in the shortest amount of time possible. Uh, and so initially, okay, what's, what's the first hurdle to that? Uh, turns out the first hurdle is setting up development environment. So we solved that, we put that in the, in the cloud. Um, and then, okay, what, what's the second hurdle of that? Well, the second hurdle is like hosting the code somewhere or, or running the code. So we solved that. Okay, what's the, what's the third? And, and by the way, along the way, it turns out these are 
uh, enormously valuable for education. Education was somewhat of a focus, but it was sort of an accidental kind of product market fit because we just wanted to solve a problem for developers. And then, um, you know, along the way, uh, turns out that like AI, actually uh, someone tweeted out our pitch deck from 2016 and had like a master plan and uh, the second plan is like, once we have a lot of users, we're gonna train these, all these models and help people code. And so in, when we started looking at, uh, especially GPT-2, it was pretty obvious for us that we need to invest in this because again, anything that shortens the distance between an idea and a product is something that we're gonna invest in. So the long-term plan of Replit is uh, like you have an idea and you talk to your phone uh, and you create an app and like you know an hour later you have your first paid customer. That's really the North Star. Yes. <laughs> you, can, you can see my writing going back, going back to 2012. So. The last question for the conference, what, I don't know, urge the audience, like what would you have them work on? Or like you, your time's limited, like what do you, there's so much excitement now. If you could say like go work on this, small, large, like what would you charge people to chase after? For me, I would urge everyone to start working on biology, chemistry with AI. I think it's an underfunded um, area that could uh, really be really beneficial for, for the world in the next, next few years. Well, I, I think um, it, you know, building like the original kind of vision of, of Siri and Alexa and these things, now it's possible. And especially with the open source models that are small, uh, you know, Whisper and Llama and Alpaca and, the, and these things, and also like building educational programs. So just like putting these things on a smartphone. So try to figure out how to put a large language models on a smartphone. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work in open source. We were just talking about a guy in uh, Bulgaria who like not part of the like Silicon Valley elite, you know, found Llama on the internet and did this process called quantization and now Llama runs on a, like a seven billion parameter model, runs on a Pixel 6 phone. And so uh, like imagine like now like a sort of a kid in Africa being able to learn English by talking to Llama on their phone. I mean that's pretty freaking amazing. Uh, you know, and I would love to see not just open source but also startup companies start building that. I just want to say thank you to everybody. You know, this is, <laughs> I am a small subsec and very appreciative of all you coming out. I super want to thank the Volley team, Max, James, Gabby. I want to thank Riley. There's a whole crew I don't know all the names of. And really, I appreciate all you. I know like many of you could have been on stage and that's what's made this such an appealing event. Enjoy the cocktail hour. It's here till eight. Hang out with everybody. And thank you so much for coming to Cerebral Valley.